Overview of the Book of Revelation, Episode 2, Chapters 8 through 11. We are the 30th of March, 2023. Following our arbitrary uh, structure of the Book of Revelation, based on the Greek tragedy, the medium of the century in which the book was written, now come to Episode 2, which seems to correspond to the half times of the book of Revelation. That is, we're getting into the final judgments against the world system. My learning objectives today are simple. To situate the wrath of the Lamb in prophecy. To identify causes of natural and social failure. And then to understand how this world is passing away. Now, just by way of review, uh, we suggested that the Great Tribulation is a scriptural phrase that covers from the time of the Maccabean Revolt all the way up through the Gospel of Jesus, through the Church Age, into the end times, and will culminate in the wrath of the Lamb. Just by way of a summary of what we're going into, this section itself tells us these, that these events will occur during a period of five months, four weeks short of a half time. It will begin with silence in heaven. Now, heavens are very busy. Apparently, things were getting serious. So when you're in the heavens, in silence for half an hour, you wonder if you've lost your hearing. No singing going on, no rejoicing. Now, there are saints up in the heavens, or at least in the presence of God somewhere, and they're praying, or they have been praying, and we learn that ancient prophecies are about to be fulfilled, which were spoken through the Lord's servants, the prophets. And this is leading into the wrath of the land, which they say is coming. So this time will be attended by a number of natural disasters because of supernatural causes, leading to, drum roll if you please, what the WEF has been announcing and advocating for? Depopulation. Mm. However, of those who are aligned with evil, who will be depopulated, uh -huh. nevertheless, they will resist repentance, uh -huh. and the end of time testimony will be rejected, but victory will be proclaimed over this world. Praise system. the Lord. I think we just did. Yes. And there will be praise to God in the heavens. Yes. And remember, our episodes all start in the heavens, move to the earth, and then go back into the heavens with praise towards God. I was thinking, what are the guidelines regarding eschatology, and especially this book? And first of all, I try to find my meanings in the Hebrew Bible and Second Temple literature before I draw them from other sources. So if the Greek Bible itself has something to say that has been borrowed by the book of Revelation, I will look there first. If I don't find anything, then I'll look at other possible meanings. Secondly, I'm trying to catch the flow of the drama. What is the big mural message of the book of Revelation before I get too involved in trying to interpret little details, some of which may not even be interpretable? Thirdly, I try to consider historical and future fulfillments before trying to apply any of this book to current events or politicians. To note that heavenly scenes employ a lot of symbology, whereas the earthly fulfillments remain more literal. I find that picture interesting that you chose for this section. That's still photo from Apocalypse Now? It is. Yeah. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. I had one old uh, manuscript from before the 5th century inserted, made themselves ready. Uh, all right, what do you observe? If heaven is a timeless place, how do they measure half an hour? 
In other words, six days of time seven. has no meaning in eternity. Yes. Uh, Half an hour, that would be about five days. Notice the seven angels who are mentioned. I suspect that those are the seven spirits who were mentioned in the previous section. Now they are on their way to earth as messengers. Each one is given a trumpet. Trumpets in the Old Testament and in Jewish literature and in Roman times were very important signal devices. You could get a, the attention of an entire crowd. The first angel blew his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. Uh, these allusions to hail and fire and mixed with blood and so forth, there are such passages in the Hebrew Bible. So the language was borrowed right out of Scripture. A third of the earth, does that sound serious? Yes. Pretty serious. But two-thirds of the earth are left unburned. Right. Except the green grass. Maybe that's all the water. Now the green grass, this is yeah. serious. This is not talking about the lawn that you have around your, your house. It might be included, but what's the importance of grass? It feeds the animals. It does. This is fodder <laughs> for your herds. So this is serious stuff. Likewise, there's so much of it around the world, if it catches on fire, you have to know how to save yourself when the winds blow a grass fire your way. Set another fire. So, we do have here, perhaps, the hint that much of the land of the earth will have been confiscated by international organizations. A third of these, not only forests, but food trees. And of course, the fields and the flora, this is a serious situation. But if that doesn't get your attention, maybe his trumpet too will. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Again, there's a lot of food sources you know, for the population destroyed here. Blood is a biblical symbol for death. Death is kind of an abstract term, but when you talk about blood, this is serious. This is right in your face. If we're in any doubt, a third of the living creatures in the sea have died. Where do they go? Some sink, others float to the top, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And I wonder, what do you suppose a great mountain? When did mountains start flying? Volcanoes. They, in fact, they say that that mountain on the Canary Islands that was erupting uh, a few months back, there was a serious worry on the part of geologists that the mountain would split and would fall into the sea. And if it should do so, they calculated that the tsunami, that is the sea waves caused by that, would hit Europe and would flood miles inland, including the coast of Africa and would even reach the North America. So when a mountain slides into the sea or falls into the sea, that's hugely important. So in any event, all the attempts on the part of humans to protect the seas will be overridden. Remember, the, this also includes our seafood sources. Stuff. If you're not plant-based. Nope. <laughs> and of course, maritime trade is disrupted. Nearly everything that you and I purchased today got to the United States aboard a big container ship. I noticed that it says like a great mountain, so I think we can eliminate mountains from... That's possible, but when Daniel said, I saw someone like a human being coming into the throne room and was given rule over the world, and in the book of Revelation, I, again it will say, I saw someone like a human being, who came down and harvested the earth. It's a biblical way of saying, the one I saw had the resemblance of a human being, and in fact, was. Don't make too much of the English term, like. It's a biblical way of saying, this actually was. And I know it was because I saw it. And here's what I saw. I saw that which looks like a human being. 
significance in the green wording having a soul? Yes. Uh, that, wherever you see the green text, that's a manuscript variant. However, we don't, do not suggest that that <coughs> is original. But I thought you'd like to know how biblical scribes sometimes would alter the text because they didn't hear it correctly being read or the spelling of the phrase is so similar to the word around it that it got misspelled. Are there things in the seed that have a soul? Yes. What does it mean to have a soul? I, when, a bo when you're aboard a ship or an aeroplane and you're in trouble, the tower also always asks how many souls, souls are aboard. Hmm. Right, to have a soul means you are alive. It's conscious life. Are any sea life conscious? At least the bigger ones. Yeah. <laughs> At least me, well, maybe the mammals. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. You can purchase Wormwood. Go to Amazon. It is a food supplement, very bitter, it's effective against intestinal worms. Is it the name for the devil? No. Uh, Only in the screw tape letters. Screw tape letters, that's it. Okay. Yeah. The atomic power plant that blew up in northern Ukraine 20 years ago, Chernobyl, is the uh, Slavic term for wormwood. I look at that blazing and stuff like that. I'm thinking it's common. It's possible. There's also, we know that in antiquity, the term star was often used for angels. Any of the stars that moved around in the sky, such as planets, were often believed to be spiritual beings, divinities, gods, or angels. We don't know here exactly what this is, but it does contaminate the sweet water sources around the world, which are becoming more and more contaminated all the time. These are the waters that are being taxed by the rich that many governments around the world have sold their municipal and national water supplies to international corporations who then raise the rates and they stop making repairs. But the governments walk away with a huge pile of money. We didn't know, okay, this is an ancient worm remedy that all the readers would be familiar with. Something they didn't like to take, but it had a purpose. It killed worms. Do you get the illusion here? The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining. What's the obvious importance of a good light source in a world where there's no electricity? When does most crime occur? At night. During the dark. I said earlier, we'll try to look for a scriptural fulfillment before we try to make a current event. <laughs> I couldn't help thinking of a lot of the climate insanity that our politicians are using against us and the in their obedience to billionaires. Insufficient light for agriculture. Food stops growing. Yeah. No yeah. And God is going to frustrate everyone who believes in astrology and most of the ancient world followed astrology. And in fact, even the Hebrew Bible uses a lot of the phraseology of the zodiac to talk about the, the sovereignty of God. Well, there's a fifth trumpet, oh. which is called the first woe. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Then, from the smoke, came locusts, people who do not have the seal of God, will seek death and will not find it. For five months they have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. <laughs> Can you imagine a spirit being like that? What would he do with our food plants? our food distribution sorts all across the country. Cut them off? Cut them off and blow them up? What would he do with our animals? 
our herds across the country Get at our meat packing plants. Confiscate them. Confiscate them or blow them up or sell them to the Chinese. Claim ownership over most of the land, the water sources, and the atmosphere of the most productive parts of our country. They would cause a train wreck that would leak chemicals, which you could then light on fire, and they would burn for days, whoa, whoa. releasing dioxins into the air, the water, yeah, the sea, requiring that the government confiscate the whole region and sell it to bankers. Oh, excuse me, we're not dealing with current events. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's come back to the text. This is worldwide. This is worldwide, so that I do not believe that our current government is fulfilling this text. This is still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet. The number of mounted troops was twice ten thousand times ten thousand. A third of mankind was killed. The rest of mankind did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons and idols of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. All right, if we understand the passage correctly, there's no mention of any saints in this passage. No presence of the church. No one's bearing witness to the Lord Jesus. We seem to be dealing with a period of future history, perhaps when the, the believers will have been removed from the earth. And so we're talking here about those who felt that they had finally gotten rid of the Christians, there are those pests who are constantly contradicting with logic our belief system. And they will suffer one-third depopulation. Remember, the evil, when they talk about depopulating, they never include themselves. Is this similar to the uh, plagues that uh, Moses uh, brought on it? That every time something happened, if gave a scientific, the blood is now the red blood, and all that, and so isn't this a duplication of what happened in the... Yes, a good analogy. Whoever during this time feels that they are the world experts who have solved the problems of humanity through technology, they're going to be very frustrated. They're going to be found incompetent to deal with the disasters that are coming upon the world. But will they repent? No. Apparently not. Who worships demons, by the way? Everyone who has any kind of a divinity or a spirit being that they honor are worshiping demons, unless it's the, the true God and his Messiah, Jesus. Idols, of course, are physical expressions of spiritual beings who are thought to come dwell within those idols. So is that like they're worshiping the creation rather than the creator? Yes. And remember, the creation includes spirit beings. Spirit beings are all created beings. And there will be some human beings who will be thought to have divine qualities and therefore are worthy of worship. All right, the term here for prostitution. There's, an, <laughs> there's another word that is spelled almost the same, which translates wickedness. Or their thefts. Uh, who commits the biggest thefts? <laughs> Governments. Well, was it Morgan who said, it takes a man of violence to rob a bank, it takes a man of intelligence to steal the bank. You have to know corporate law really well to do that. All right, the term for murder here, phonos. Jesus said this comes from the heart. Sorceries is the term pharmakon, which is the Greek word for drug, medicine, uh, or... Big pharma. You can use the term pharmakon. Prostitution is porneia, all forms of sexual immorality. And theft, klema, which kind of sounds like klepting. You know the word pharma or sorcery, I think of witchcraft and uh, magic. Yes. But what does witchcraft and magic mainly use to manipulate human beings? Chemicals, substances, deception, herbs, drugs. preparations. The, uh, so the big part of pharmacy historically and in many parts of the world today is the use of local substances. You mean like vaccines? Oh, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, boss. Anyway. There's an intermission in heaven. Then I saw another mighty angel 
coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud, with a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his legs like pillars of fire. There would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Uh, this angel, where have we met him before? He showed up once, uh, once earlier in this book. Daniel. That sounds right. Daniel chapter 10, we had this angel appear, where he was called a man. You think it was an angelic man. But in chapter 1 of Revelation, he shows up. He's the one who says, I was dead, but am now alive. And we remember the very first verse of the Revelation says, God revealed this to his servants. He gave this message to Jesus, who sent his angel to give these visions to John. John sent them to the churches. In the churches, someone read the documents, and the others listened. So this sounds like the angel who is the visible representation of the Lord Jesus himself. Why can't I read this? To me, I, I read this and I think of this, this is Jesus coming, his return. Yeah, yeah, it's, going, it's getting near. Yep. But there will be judgments upon the nations for about five months before he, he comes back as the reigning <coughs> king. All right, it's called a mystery in the Mystery religions, a mystery was only known to the followers of the religion, and they never told anyone the secrets. So, for example, if you're a member of the Masons, or one of his auxiliary organizations, for women or for youth, Dimole, there are secrets you're never to tell to anyone on the outside. So you have to go to Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, technology. Right. right. There's mention here of the prophets. Okay, so these, this is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Scriptures. In the Hebrew Scriptures, this time was called the Day of the Lord. And remember, John himself said, while I was on Patmos, I was projected into the Day of the Lord. Saw these things happening, and now he's writing them down for us. All right, the temple of God. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for forty-two months, and I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for one thousand two hundred sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. It's three and a half years, 42 months. It's the, that would be the lunar calendar, three and a half which years. was... Three and a half years. Oh, this term here, the temple of God, is the exact same phrase, even down to the, the noun cases that are employed, to 2 Thessalonians 2.4, where we're told that the lawless one will enter into and take his seat, presenting himself as some kind of God. The Antichrist. In any event, he, Antichrist, is not mentioned here. There are several theories, though, as to what is meant by the Temple of God. If you go back to the Qumran literature, this Temple of God was equated with God's chosen remnant. Of course, Qumran had rejected the ministry of the Temple in Jerusalem. And so they took temple here to be some kind of metaphor for themselves. And of course, in Revelation 12, there'll be a similar idea. Others say, well, if this book was written in the 60s, then possibly Herod's temple, or the second temple, was still standing and was about to be trampled for at least <laughs> three and a half years by invading Roman armies. That would be the preterist position. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 says, well, we believers, we are the temple of God. And in another context, your body is a Christian, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, you are the temple of God. Then you have the mention of God's temple up in the heavens, 1417. A year or two ago, there was some talk amongst those 
participating in the Abraham Accords, there was talk of building an interfaith worship center where Jews, Christians, and Muslims could come together and worship the same true God. Uh, others say, well, no, this is Ezekiel's temple. However, some say it's the plan for the Millennial Temple. It's fun to speculate about. Then others say, well, no, this is another end times temple. Something is yet to be constructed. And we know that there are organizations in Israel. You can go online and see the, the priestly costumes that they've already prepared. And all of the utensils and golden altars, they're all ready to go. They just need a stone structure to stick them in and start the Old Testament sacrificial system again. Or a tent structure. Theories as to what is meant by the 1,260 days. If these are solar days, then they're mentioned twice in the book. If they are the equivalent to 42 lunar months, all right, there are two other texts where that is mentioned. Uh, is it the same as the three and a half years? Then that's mentioned in a fifth text. So if you want to add these all up, it's not three and a half plus three and a half. It's five times three and a half. All right? So if this is really a calendar reference, then this is the possibly the duration of the end times, three and a half years, or duration of certain of the end of time events. And others say, well, it's calendric, but it's, it's symbolic of Christ's soon return, chronologically or sequentially. But again, if it's calendric, another way to take this, uh, this is one half of the week mentioned in Daniel 9.27 which most dispensationalists say is the case, although nearly everybody who studies scripture says, well, no, 927 was fulfilled in the seven years between 167 and 160 BCE in the Maccabean revolt, which then Jesus repurposed to refer to the Roman invasion of 65 through 71, which was also a week, and right in the middle of which, the Jews took the decision to stop the daily sacrifice on behalf of the Roman emperor. So, there are lots of ways you could take this. I kind of take it as, in the context, three and a half years during which these events will take place. Also theories as to what is meant by the two witnesses. Interpreters say, well, this, this, uh, this idea of a high priest and king, who are perhaps the same man, comes from the book of Zechariah. <laughs> but others say well, this has to be Enoch and Elijah because neither of those men ever died. And the Bible is very clear. It is counted unto every man wants to die. And since they haven't died yet, they have to come back and die. Well, wait, wait, wait. When Jesus shall return, he will raise the dead in Christ. But those of us who are remaining, will he kill us? No, we'll be caught up. But we'll be caught up alive. We will not die. That's so right. it is not absolutely necessary that every human being die. Although to this day, there are only two we know of who escaped it. So anyway, that's all very logical, but it does not follow that everyone must die. Could be right. <clears throat> Others say, well, it has to be Moses and Elijah because they do mosaic kinds of miracles. And of course, only Moses could do that. Or could anyone else do a mosaic type judgment? Just because you do the same miracles doesn't mean you're the same person. Oh, see, that's, that's also logical. Uh, we're not done yet. Uh, theologians suggest that these are Israel and the church, both of whom were God's witnesses. Old Testament times it was Israel, New Testament times it's the church. And so what this book is, is saying is that Wait a minute, will Israel and the church be there? Yes. And so these are not two individual men. These are two movements. Hey, when you're dealing with symbology, aren't we allowed to make it mean anything we want? Especially if it fits our theology? Our theology, remember, cannot be wrong. Oh, well, wait, some say, no, this, these are the spirit and the bride who are, we're told in chapter 22 are inviting the world to repent. Oh, no. <laughs> Guys, this is, this means these are Jews and Gentiles. 
as we saw in the passage last week. So both the Jews and the Gentiles will be witnessing to Jesus during this time. Again, we can make Scripture mean anything we want. Oh, well, hey, some say these are the Catholics and the Orthodox on one hand and the Protestants on the other. Okay, but will the church actually still be present during this time of three and a half years? Haven't figured that one out yet. Maybe we'll next week. No, it's the first and the New Testaments. It's just a personification of the Bible. Remember, we can make the Bible mean anything we want. Oh, and then there's Galen's position. <laughs> oh, these are two real human beings whom we just have not yet identified with any certainty. In fact, they may not even be born yet. Just looking at the book for what it says, and every one of those other interpretations has definite weaknesses, whether chronology or identity or just faulty logic. I don't know who they are, and I don't know anybody with who, with any certainty, can identify them by name. So let's let them show up, witness in Jerusalem. It will be in Israel, right? It will be in Israel. It will be in Jerusalem. They'll probably stand in front of the temple. Yes. Well, that makes a lot of sense because I mean, there'd be a whole lot of groups wearing dress. Yeah, yeah for the Holy Spirit, it's all over. Here. <laughs> right, yeah. In which case, if you can spiritualize the two men, why not spiritualize the whole city or the whole period of time as just being the general conflict between good and evil? The third woe is soon to come. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Becoming king over the world, he now can do anything with it he wants, and he is destroying the current evil system. And he's about to return then as the victorious king of the world. He has become king. He will reign. He has the recent past and the soon future. Reading seems strange. Our Lord. And In Greek, you don't say Yahweh. In Greek, you say the Lord. And so this would be the, the New Testament equivalent of the name Yahweh. Yahweh and his Messiah, who we believe to be Yeshua, Jesus. That's, I mean, that's the way I figure it out. Does that make sense? Oh, the two, the two entities so God, Messiah, God, Yahweh, and Jesus, Messiah. Yes, they're the same God, but they're not the same person. Now, how, how throughout the Old Testament could God be both the Lord in heaven and the angel of the Lord on earth, who is called Yahweh, which led to a doctrine of two Yahwehs. So I have a book in my library, if you borrow it if you'd like, entitled. The Two Powers in Heaven by Alan Siegel, professor of Ju uh, Judaism at I think, New York University, explaining how that all throughout ancient times, belief of many of the rabbis was that Yahweh was a biunity, and which then in the New Testament, with the arrival of Messiah, becomes a triunity. And therefore, he explains this is why we Jews so easily became Christians because we didn't have to change anything we already believed about the true living God, Yahweh. He's now Jesus, too. All right, so the kingdom of this world? Sounds, I'm wondering if this means a kingdom over the whole world. Are we talking here about global government? One world government. I sent you a link to an article. If you really want to be, have your socks frightened off, read that article about how the World Economic Forum a few weeks ago, has made a new alliance with Islam. My wife was reading it this morning. All right, has become, or is about to become, the Lord in his Christ. Okay, here we are. The true invisible God rules over earth through his anointed human king. Amen. For how long? Forever. Oh, Ooh. eternity. Okay. So Daniel chapter 7 comes true in the person of the Lord Jesus. And we'll hear more from him in a subsequent episode. Glory to God. At that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, 
7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. What city do you suppose that was? Jerusalem. It has to be, yeah. This is where the temple was located, where those two human beings will be put to death. Moses and Elijah. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> it's on the Mount of Transfiguration. They may have been laying their plans for the future. How do, the, how do these earthlings who have refused to repent, how do they glorify God? Do they all get saved? If they refuse to repent, then they don't glorify God. They get martyred. Well, God is glorified in two ways. In every human being. One of two ways. Grace or judgment. Salvation or damnation. Both glorify God. On the one hand, you glorify the grace of God. On the other hand, you glorify the holiness of God. I was on the horn last on Zoom last evening with a missionary out in Thailand, and he said he has found a way to explain to Thai people who believe that whatever spirit is driving the Buddha is only holy and good. They like to become Christians, some of them, so that God will forgive of all of their sins without having to abandon their sins. It doesn't work that way. And so he draws two lines, parallel, vertical. One is labeled grace, and the other one's labeled holiness. And he says, there's the narrow path. Jesus said, follow the narrow path. Stay on the path. Do not go into the error of grace that forgives everything, nor the error of a God damns everyone. Get forgiven and change. Repent and believe the good news. Glorify is a verbal statement. They're proclaiming this is God, and he's who he is. Okay. It, you can glorify God by your, your good words and your good deeds. But God is also glorified in the sense that His holiness is affirmed, upheld, established, and eternally effective on the part of those who refuse His salvation and go into damnation. Both glorify God. Or maybe they do say, this must be a work of God, whether they repent or not. <coughs> but it's just not said. So how do the terrified lost give glory to God? Maybe and say, hey, maybe we were wrong. Yes, they're plummeting. All right, but at the same time, there is worship to God in heaven. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign, destroying the destroyers of the earth. Like that last phrase, I just find amazing. God destroys those who destroy the earth. Wait a minute, wasn't it the angels who were destroying the earth? Well, do those angels actually destroy the earth, or it's, or it's, the, or it's man that they have deceived and corrupted that destroy the earth, so then all of them would be... Well, for one thing, the term destroy here means to spoil, to corrupt, or to ruin such as a rotting corpse or throwing something out into the rubbish. And so those who are corrupting the earth will themselves be corrupted. The term here, earth, just to get your blood roiling, the term, it's just gay, as in the goddess Gaia, translated typically land or the, the land of Israel, the ground, the soil, the territory or a country, since there was very little concept of the earth as a planet by most folk in antiquity, it's not used, this term is not used as the name of a planet. So part of the question here is, all of these things that are happening in the end time, how widespread will they be? Does it have to be planetary? Or could it just be international? Or hemispheric? Or just the Middle East? Or predominantly in Israel? Linguistically, you can go all over all of those distances. What seems most probable to you? 
International. International at least, yeah. Or at least all of the nations that will have aligned themselves with the one world government ruled by Antichrist. So you say the earth was more of a territory or a land. So going back to Genesis, created heaven and earth. Is they weren't thinking globally, possibly, they were thinking territorially. Uh, there you have the contrast between that which is up and that which is down. So my my thinking is is round. We all went to government school and we learned that we dwell on the globe. But most of antiquity weren't thinking about that. As, or if they had been thinking about it, they would have said so. But the contrast is that everything that is airy, fairy, and invisible contrasted that which is solid, inhabitable, and visible. A third of the uh, creatures in the sea are dying. Okay. That, that's got to be more than, than just a, a, International. a regional area. Okay, yeah, which is being crowded. So let's make it planetary. Yeah. If all of this is to happen in some three and a half year period that's yet to come, why is this important to us? Or if not to us, why is it important? It doesn't go on forever. Okay. That's it a, it goes on for three and a half years. Jesus, in fact, said, uh, if God had not shortened the time, no flesh would survive. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be survivors. There will be. Right? Anything else why this is an important text? God's going to win. From a scriptural perspective, the text itself said, this is what God's servants, the prophets, had predicted. And so biblical prophecy must be fulfilled. And if all scripture fulfilled to date was fulfilled literally in time and space, then we expect all prophecy to be filled in the future will come to pass in time and space. That's just, of course, my human mind trying to be consistent. All right, regarding righteousness, the righteous will be rewarded. What about wickedness? Oh, will be punished. All right, regarding Jesus himself. He already sits on the throne. On the throne of heaven, where he reigns, it is he who will send out judgment at the right time, and it is he who will take possession of the entire earth upon his return. Mm -hmm. Jesus will likewise, he intervenes in human history, mm -hmm. and will do so intensely in times to come. For next time, episode 3, chapters from the end of 11 through 15, <coughs> the entire stretch of human history from the time of Jesus all the way up through just before the New Jerusalem descends on the earth.